Let's read together our text, Romans 8, verses 30 and 31. (coughs) Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Romans 8 verse 30 is a very famous and much loved verse of scripture. Personally, many saints have memorized it and derived comfort from it. And so it's appropriate too for our applicatory sermon after the Lord's Supper this morning. Because Christ's broken body and shed blood are for the predestinate, those called, justified, and glorified. Theologically, Romans 8 verse 30 is also highly significant, especially for the doctrines of grace, as we'll see more at length later. The canons of Dort in their first head, quote Romans 8 verse 30 in connection with God's eternal predestination three times. 1, head 1, 7, rejection of errors 2 and rejection of errors number 6. And one of these three articles in the Canons of Dort gives us the title for tonight's sermon. Head 1, Rejection of Errors, number 2, deals with the Arminian heresy that someone can be elect but fall away. They can be chosen to have faith but not to final salvation. The rejection of that error states, this is a fancy of men's minds invented regardless of the scriptures whereby the doctrine of election is corrupted and this golden chain of our salvation is broken. And whom he foreordained, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. Romans 8 (coughs) verse 30. You'll have heard the key phrase, the golden chain of salvation. The second half of the second verse of our text occurs in both of today's sermons. If God be for us, who can be against us? And you may have realized that that is found in both of the sermons, as you heard tonight's text read at the start of this sermon, or when you read today's bulletin earlier. And this inclusion of the statement and question, if God be for us, who can be against us, isn't an oversight, it is deliberate. When we looked at this rhetorical question this morning, it was in connection with the succeeding verse, verse 32, and Christ's atonement. And this evening, we're going to look at this rhetorical question in connection with the preceding verse, verse 30. So at the question, if God be for us, who can be against us, could be said to unite verses 30 through 32. If God be for us, who can be against us, began the morning sermon, starting us off, so to speak, and it will end this evening's sermon, rounding us off, so to speak. Let's look then at the golden chain of salvation, the beautiful links, the theological lessons, and the astonishing conclusion. The golden chain of salvation, the beautiful links, The theological lessons and the astonishing conclusion. First, our text says, 
Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. The four syllables of the word predestinate might sound formidable, but the meaning is readily grasped when predestinate is broken down into its two constituent parts. Pre means before. In this instance, before time itself, before the foundation of the world. And destinate is, comes from the word destiny. And destinate, therefore, means to determine one's destiny. That isn't too hard. And the destiny to which we are destinated, even predestinated, is set forth in verse 29. The destiny is our conformity to Jesus Christ, our sinlessly bearing the image of the incarnate Son of God, and hence the image of God, no less. So that Jesus Christ is exalted as the firstborn brother amongst all of his younger brothers and sisters. Verse 29 reads, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate, that is, before the foundation of the world, he determined their destiny, namely, to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And you're all concluding at this point, wow, that is some destiny. You may not, and you probably won't, to be honest, achieve anything great that will be recorded in the history books and annals of our age, so your destiny may not to be some great wealthy Millionaire, sports star, top of the field, genius, celebrity. But you have a far greater destiny. Everyone who believes in Jesus. This is the destiny to which we are destinated. So we can't miss it. This is the destiny to which we have been predestinated by God in eternity. You will notice... That it is people who are predestinated to be conformed to one glorious person. Verse 30 begins, Moreover, whom, that's the people, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. Verse 29 says, Moreover, whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. So predestination in our text is personal. It is a predestination by God of certain people, plural, to be conformed to one glorious person, the Son of God. As you know, there are some who seek to evade the truth of predestination by corrupting it through a false view of divine foreknowledge. They say God foreknows that certain people will repent and believe the gospel. Other people will reject it. But he, looking down the corridors of history, so to speak, will see that there's that person believing and this person's going to repent at this time or other and that's foreknowledge. But notice what verse 29 says. For whom he did foreknow. It says nothing about foreknowing certain actions, nothing about foreknowing whether or not this person will repent or believe. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. People are foreknown. So both God's 
foreknowledge and his predestination are of persons, the exact same persons, and both God's foreknowledge and predestination are to be broken down and explained in similar complementary ways. Both God's foreknowledge and predestination are divine acts before the foundation of the world. For no. For is like before. God knew before certain people. Predestinate. Pre means before. Again. God predestinated and God foreknew us before he created all things. And then these two imminent divine acts for knowing and predestinating are closely related. God eternally foreknew us with the deep, intimate knowledge of love. You only have I known of all the people in the earth. Amos 3 verse 2. Matthew seven twenty three. Jesus Christ says on the last day to some, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye accursed. Now he's going to be a terrible judge if he doesn't even know intellectually the one before him or anything that that person has done. When he says, I never knew you, he means I never loved you. I never knew you Intimately, <coughs> closely. <coughs> That's the idea of foreknowledge in our text. God eternally foreknew his people. That is, he loved us before the foundation of the world. And therefore, having loved us, he eternally predestinated us to salvation in Jesus Christ. That's the scripture. Romans 8 verse 29 for whom he did foreknow, he eternally knew with the deep love of God, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. And this same truth of foreknowledge and predestination is taught in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy 7, verses 6 through 8. God says of Israel, Thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen or elected or predestinated thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love upon you nor choose you, elect you or predestinate you because ye were more in number than any people for ye were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you, he predestinated and chose and elected you because he loved you. He foreknew you. That's the point. Second, the second link in the chain is calling. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And here it's helpful to distinguish God's call into an external call and an internal call. The external call is the preaching of the gospel so that the elect and the reprobate hear it with their ears externally. You're all hearing it externally. That's the external call of God through the preaching of the gospel. Then there is the internal call, which is God's speech in the heart of the sinner, which only the elect hear. That speech saves. So all who hear the inward or internal call are converted. And this internal call comes through the external call, that is, to take ourselves here tonight, the external call of the gospel is going forth. Everyone here hears it, but a subset of those who hear the external call are hearing the word of God inwardly. 
so that they receive it as God's truth. The internal call and the external call. And our text is dealing with what is called the internal call because only the elect hear it. Verse 30 says, Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. That is, it's only the predestinate who are called in this way. It's the internal call. Verse 28 says, We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called, same word again, according to his purpose. And the purpose is that of election. God's internal call of his elect, what our text is dealing with, is a powerful summons, nay, an irresistible summons, even a saving summons that brings us out of darkness into God's marvelous light, 1 Peter 2, or that translates us out of the kingdom of Satan into the kingdom of God's dear Son. Colossians 1. This course raises the very obvious question. What are you hearing tonight? I'm not now talking about the sermon. I mean what are you hearing? And what have you heard throughout your life? You have heard. All of you have heard. Many times. And are hearing the external call of the gospel. The preached word of God. Are you hearing and have you ever heard the internal call which comes through the preaching. The external call. That brings you into God's light as a child of the light. That brings you and translates you into the kingdom as a citizen of the kingdom. Believe in the living God. Trust in the crucified, risen Savior. And those who do that are those who have been called externally and inwardly by God's grace. Third, moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified. We've moved from predestination to the effectual or inner call, and now to justification. What is justification? To justify is to declare righteous. It is a legal or judicial term. It is what a judge does in a court of law when the accused having been charged with (coughs) various crimes and sins and being found innocent the judge then declares this person innocent as far as this law goes he is even righteous and this truth of justification that I have briefly explained is evident from the succeeding verses verse 33 Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? To lay something to someone's charge is to say that that person is guilty of the crime or sin attributed to them. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Bring it into God's courtroom and say, this person deserves punishment. And the answer is, it is God that justifies. So justification is is the silencing of charges against us. A legal term, a declaring of the person righteous, not guilty. Verse 34 is similar. Who is he that condemneth? It's the job of the opposing lawyer to charge you with a sin or crime. And then it's the judge who passes sentence. He either condemns, you're guilty, or he justifies, you're not guilty and you're righteous. And so this fact, this verse again proves our contention as to the legal meaning of justification. Who is he that condemneth? And the answer is nobody. Because it continues, 
It is Christ that died. Condemnation has been borne by him. Yea, rather that is risen again. So he's not under condemnation and we're in him and we can't be condemned either because we've been justified. And so Christ is even at the right hand of God who also maketh intercession for us as our advocate declaring before God his holy obedience and his righteousness so that we are righteous in him. This truth of justification is developed especially in Romans at the end of chapter 3 Throughout chapters 4 and 5, here in Romans 8, as we have seen, at the end of chapter 9, and at the start of chapter 10, for instance. To recap, in justification, the triune God as the great judge in his heavenly courtroom declares us completely innocent and totally righteous legally. He does this on the basis of the substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ for our sins and his perfect obedience of God's law for us in our stead. Because the righteousness of God, which Jesus Christ, the Son of God, earned for us, is reckoned to our account, imputed to us, and received by faith alone. Fourth, from predestination to calling to justification and now finally to glorification. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. And the basic idea of glory is what you think it to be. It's that of brilliance and light. And the glorification of a fallen human being especially includes our spiritual and moral glorification. That is, our ethical perfection and our sinless radiance so that we shine with divine luminosity. We're glorified spiritually, morally, ethically. The point isn't that God takes a human being and he lights him up like a Christmas tree or anything like that. He makes him shine with ethical purity. That's the idea. And the glory of human beings is not all their great sporting accomplishments. All their university degrees and A-levels and GCSEs and O-levels. It's not their bank account. It's not their popularity at school or in the workplace though these things have their place. Our glory as human beings is our sanctification. That is, our devotedness to the living God. Our glorification is our perfect sanctification with this distinctive idea added to it, our our perfect sanctification is From the perspective of light and radiance and brilliance. Being given white garments in the world to come is a picture of our glorification, radiance. Our glorification, to speak of it in slightly different terms, to fill out the image, is our conformity to Jesus Christ in knowledge, righteousness and true holiness. Verse 29 explains this. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. And then this puts glorification in slightly different terminology. To be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So that we look like Christ. We look like Christ spiritually of the same family. So that he is the elder brother and we're his younger brothers and sisters. Because he's glorious And we partake of his glory in a perfected sanctification. And if you ask, when will we be glorified? You could even say that we already have been glorified in a sense. Principally, glorification began at regeneration. Continually, we are being glorified 
as we grow in sanctification. You're becoming more and more glorious every day. As the years roll by, the wrinkles multiply and grow deeper, but you're becoming more holy. You're being glorified. So the scriptures teach. We will be glorified at death as to our souls made perfect in holiness, but especially glorification in this verse is referring to the last day when we will be glorified in body and soul because that is what we are, who we are as human beings. Not merely souls, but body and soul together. When we, as to our souls and bodies, are made sinlessly perfect and all the consequences even of sin are removed, then we're glorified. And that's what Romans 8 verse 30 is looking at especially. And the perfect glorification of the saint takes place at exactly the same time as all sorts of other glorifications. You will be glorified as to your soul at a very different time than the other people probably in this room. The day of your death. But the glorification of us as human beings in the perfect, complete sense takes place for all the members of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church of Christ, the elect, redeemed, regenerated body, at exactly the same time. Namely, the last day. You die and are glorified as to your soul alone. Unless you and your wife die at the same time in a plane accident or something like that. But you are perfectly glorified soul and body with every other believer. And not only is your perfect glorification the same as time as all other Christians, but it's at the same time as the perfect glorification of Jesus Christ himself. He has been glorified to a degree with his resurrection, to a higher degree with his ascension, to a higher degree with his session at God's right hand, but Christ's own glorification in its highest sense awaits his second coming, which is the fourth and final stage in his state of exaltation. When he comes with great glory bodily and with the angels and with clouds at the end of the age to raise the dead and judge the world. Romans 8 verse 17 says, if we are children, children of God, then we're heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. You'll be glorified in the last day with all the saints and we together will be glorified with Christ at the end of this age. And there's another glorification that takes place at the same time. The creation. The inauguration of the new heavens and the new earth. Christ returns, that's his glorification. And he renews the creation, which is its glorification. And the glorification of the resurrected church is contemporaneous with the glorification of the created order. And that's the point of Romans 8, verses 18 through 23. And if you think we're finished, we're not. Because that same time is the glorification of God. When God becomes all in all. And the glorification of God is not his becoming more glorious. The individual Christian becomes more <coughs> glorious. The whole church becomes more glorious. Christ becomes more glorious too in his human nature. The creation becomes more glorious. But the glorification of God is not his becoming more glorious. It's his being seen and acknowledged and worshipped publicly for the glory that was always his. The glory which is now shrouded, denied, hated 
and darkened. That's what's coming. The glorification of us, of the whole church, of Christ, of the creation, and of God. And verse 31 says, after all this, what shall we then say to these things? The things of verse 30. And there are so many things which could be said. And here are some of them. First, God is our Savior in time and eternity. He is our Savior because He takes care of our salvation in eternity past, before the creation, when He predestinates us. His salvation includes his deliverance of us in our earthly lives. Because whom he did predestinate, them he also called in time. And whom he called in time, them he also justified. And this salvation of God, of us, is also our salvation in the next world. The everlasting age in glorification. Predestines us before time, calls, justifies us in time, and glorifies us in the next age. And not just us, but the whole church, and Christ, and the creation, and God. Declarative. Second, God's salvation of us is both legal and organic. And when I say God's salvation of us is legal... I'm dealing with justification. The courtroom, the declaration of the great judge God himself. Righteous in Christ alone. And when I say organic, I'm referring to God's work inside us, transforming and changing us, which begins in calling or regeneration, and which ends in glorification. And so it is that God's salvation deals with both the two main aspects of our sin and misery. Sin is guilt. Sin is liability to punishment. And justification deals with that. You're not guilty. You're righteous in Christ. Sin is also pollution and bondage. That is, sin makes you spiritually unclean and filthy. You feel that in your conscience too. And sin is bondage. So you can't do the things that you would. And you're trapped in evil ways of thinking and behaving and speaking. God calls us out of the kingdom of darkness. Into the kingdom of God's dear son. God glorifies us. So that even the remnants of sin that are in us. The old man is destroyed. A complete salvation from a complete Savior. That's what Romans 8 verse 30 is dealing with. And so we come third, because we're asking and answering the question, what shall we then say to these things? Third, Calvinism, a nickname I know, but it's shorthand. Calvinism is true, and Arminianism is false. That's one of the things that we have to say to these things in Romans 8 verse 30. Calvinism, like the scriptures, teaches T for total depravity, which is presupposed in our text. This explains to us why salvation is needed. And that's developed at great length in Romans 1 through 3. Calvinism teaches not only T for total depravity, but U for unconditional election, that is salvation decreed. Whom he did predestinate. The destiny is conformity to Jesus Christ. And that destiny was <coughs> foreordained before the foundation of the world. An unconditional election goes hand in hand with unconditional reprobation. God's passing by and ordaining to destruction. The other part of mankind in the way of their sins. For the declaration of his glorious justice. 
Romans 9 deals with that at great length. Verse 18 says, Therefore hath he mercy on whom he wills or wishes or wants to have mercy, the elect, and whom he will or wishes or wants, he hardeneth. Which is the exact opposite of the notion that God wants to save everybody. Romans 9 verse 18 and many other texts I could say, says that God wishes and wants not to save everybody, but to reprobate some. Romans 11 deals with unconditional reprobation too. In verse 7 for instance, Israel hath not obtained that which it seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it positively, and the rest, the non-elect or reprobate, were blinded or hardened. T for total depravity, U for unconditional election and unconditional reprobation, L for limited atonement or particular redemption, that speaks of salvation purchased, because as we saw this morning, verses 32 through 34, he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died for God's elect, the all of us, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us, all of us, God's elect. T for total depravity, U for unconditional election, L for limited atonement, and I for irresistible grace, and P for the perseverance of the saints, that's salvation applied and not lost. Because Romans 8 verse 30 says, that whom he did predestinate, them he also called, that's irresistible grace. And whom he called, them he also justified, that's irresistible grace too. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. And that entails the perseverance of the saints, so that none of those predestinated, none of those called, none of those justified, fails to make it to the glorified stage. The exact same people, not one more, not one less, are predestinated, as are called, as are justified, as are glorified. None lost and no chain broken. The four chains, predestination, calling, justification and glorification interlock and they've never been broken. And the devil has tried and the false church has nearly broken its back trying to break and pull apart these chains. And they're still there. Still there. They haven't even got near breaking them because they're unbreakable. It's the golden chain of salvation. A fourth point. Here in Romans 8 verse 30 we have the basis or core of for the ordo salutis. And that big word, ordo salutis, means exactly what you think it means. Ordo, order. Salutis, salutation, salvation. It's the order of salvation. There is an order in which the orderly God applies to us the salvation he has decreed and purchased for us. Predestination, pre-temporal. But the Ordo Salutis deals with the order of salvation that God applies to us in time. And here it is, calling, and then after calling, justification. He doesn't justify us before he calls us. He calls us, then he justifies us. And then he glorifies us. He doesn't glorify us before he justifies us or glorify us before he calls us. He calls us, that's step one mentioned in the text. After that comes justification and after that comes glorification. In that order, one, two, three. Calling, justification, glorification. The application of our salvation to us isn't haphazard or higgledy piggledy. This isn't that there's no rhyme or reason to it. There is, there's a logic to it. Calling, justification, glorification. We can add and expand to that list. God calls us and so gives us faith, number two, 
And out of and by faith we are justified, number three. And those who are justified are also adopted, number four, legally reckoned God's children. And then we have the ongoing work of sanctification, number five. You can't be sanctified before you're justified, the way I'm defining them. And th- those who are sanctified, in our step is the perseverance of the saints. And after that comes glorification. Here is the core, the central text, better than any other text in all the Bible, to show to us not only the connection between God's predestination and his work in time and God's predestination and our glorification, but the order of salvation itself, the core passage. And then fifth, all of God's salvation of us is in Jesus Christ, as Romans 8 verse 30 in connection with all of Paul's epistles especially makes clear. We are predestinated, not apart from Christ or beside Christ, but in Christ. Because God has chosen us, predestinated us or elected us in Christ before the foundation of the world. Ephesians 1 verse 4. The calling. God calls us in Christ. Justification. God justifies us in Christ. Glorification. We are glorified in Christ. In Christ. And so, sixth, all of us, this assures us of our so great salvation. Since Romans 8, verse 30 is true, objectively, we cannot be lost, we who believe in Jesus. And so, subjectively, we in our hearts and mind are certain of it. That is, we are assured of it. If Romans 8 verse 30 isn't true or is even dubious, no one could be assured of their election, of their redemption, of their calling, of their justification and especially their glorification. But since it is true, all true believers can trust this great God who has begun a good work and who will complete it. And so the Apostle, in explaining the truths of verses 30 and 31 and 32, the words we looked at today, and he goes on and says a bit more in 33 and 34, comes to this ringing declaration, verse 35, Since all this is the case, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? We can't be separated. There's an unbreakable golden chain. And then he lists all the things that somebody could possibly reckon would separate you from the love of Christ. Would mean that you lose your salvation and you perish everlastingly. If you were persecuted, maybe that would do it. Or maybe the devil could do it. Well, Paul says, verse 38, I am persuaded, or to use a more theological term, I am assured, I have assurance that neither death nor life. Well, what else is there left? If you're living, that can't separate you. And if you're dying, you can't can't separate you. Nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, that is the devil, or some other angel, or all of the demons, not even the good angels, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature, and since there only is God, and creatures, and God's hardly going to stop it, then there isn't anything which can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. In fact, our text makes all this crystal clear when it teaches that our salvation is already sure and in that sense already even accomplished in God's decree. The text does not say, moreover, whom he did predestinate in the past, so to speak, then he will call. And those whom he will call, he will justify. And then this one has to be future. And those who are predestinated and called and justified shall someday in the future be glorified. It doesn't say that. Romans 8 verse 30 says, Moreover, whom he did predestinate, an aorist, completed action, them he also called, aorist, completed action, and whom he called, them he also justified, aorist, like a tense, completed action, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. Completed action. 
the perspective of this text is that we are glorified now from the perspective of God's decree. It's a completed act in God's counsel. It's not a completed act, our glorification in history and time. It's a completed act in God's counsel. So you ought to be assured of your salvation. Your salvation is absolutely certain. There is a possibility, at perhaps some ground, that the sun mightn't rise tomorrow. Lots of people could be saved. All the elect could be guaranteed. Antichrist would come really, really quickly or something like that. At least hypothetically. But there isn't any possibility in any sense or any shape or form with any reasoning that you as a true child of God will be lost. And so finally, seventh in this point, and this very briefly, all this inspires worship. Amazement at God's wonders. When Paul said, verse 31, what shall we say to these things? It wasn't, oh, what do we say to this? It was, what will we say to these things? That's more like it. And that's worship, as is the remainder of the chapter. And so we return, finally, to the question with which we began this morning's sermon If God be for us, who can be against us? And I trust that nobody here has managed to come up with an answer to that and say, ah, but there's this that's against us. You haven't. I know you haven't. And now I want you to notice what the apostle does in verse 31. He has been speaking about, verse 30, predestination, calling, justification, and glorification. Those four Links in the golden chain. Predestination, calling, justification, glorification. That's verse 30. And then in verse 31, in his reflections upon verse 30, he brings in the concept of God being for us. And you say to yourself, Paul didn't talk about God being for us in verse 30. Ah, but he did. Ah, but he did. And this is what the Holy Spirit teaches us through this scripture. You know what predestination is? And I hope you can remember something of the definition. Pre and destinate. Well, what predestination is, according to the perspective of verse 31, is this. It means God is for you. That's what it means. It means God is for you. In such a way that he's not against you, never has been against you, can't be indifferent, and will... Always do everything necessary to save you. What is calling? Well, you said it had to do with a summons and God translate. Yes, yes, that's all true. But what does it mean according to verse 31? It means God is for you. That's what it means. Even the children can understand that. I didn't, I mean, I didn't know what he said. It's a predest, that was very hard. But at the end he said, God is for me. And I got that bit. Well, everybody can get that. But there's something, there's something for everybody to go home with. Yeah? What is justification? Well, he talked about a courtroom and God declaring that we were righteous. I think that was what he said. Well, it certainly means this, though. God is for me. What is glorification? Something to do with light and holiness and being radiant with the glory of Jesus Christ and sanctification. And it means that God is for me. So in those four things, God is for me. He predestinated me. He called me. He justified me. He glorified me. He's for me. And I could add, he sanctifies and all the other things in the order of salvation. And so the truth of Calvinism, a nickname, that is the truth of God's sovereign grace means that you're not a grumbler or a moaner or a defeatist or a loser. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And if you think more than conquerors is too long a phrase, I'll give you one word, a wee short one, three letters. It means God is for us. He's for me and you and for the whole true elect church of Jesus Christ. For us. And So let's take in concluding. Verse 31b. If God be for us, who can be against? Let's take this as pivotal. Between verse 30, or 
evening sermon at verse 32 in the morning. Before the foundation of the world, God is for us. That's the truth of predestination. That's verse 30. At the cross, God is for us. That's verse 32. If God delivered up his own son for us and didn't spare him. How will he not also with him freely give us all things? In our Christian life, God is for us. In calling and in justification. Verse 30. And in the world to come, God is for us. Glorification. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, bless to us thy word, that we may have comfort in it, that we may know that thou art for us. And may we, by thy grace, be more and more clearly and sharply and earnestly for thee. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.